Uh, we appreciate your virtual attendance, and uh, we hope that if there's anything we can do for you that we certainly can. We have as our theme for this year, and we only have this month and next to address this, uh, the theme of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and we spent several months uh, both setting up and going through the fruit of the Spirit as identified and outlined in Galatians chapter 5. And now, as uh, we have moved into the last few months and we've exhausted those fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians 5, we've moved to 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 1, there is a list of what has been termed the Christian graces. And many of those graces o coincide and overlap with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, but there are a few which do not. And those are the ones that we're focusing on last month, this month, and our last month of the year in December. Last month we talked about the grace virtue. And here we are this morning moving back into 2 Peter chapter 1, and as we move through that list, notice another of the so-called graces that's not found in the fruit of the Spirit. In verse 5 of 2 Peter chapter 1, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about knowledge. Now what do we mean when we say knowledge? It's from the word gnosis, um, and it, it has to do with knowledge that we gain in an active way. Uh, there is a word in the New Testament that's often translated to know or knowledge that has to do with just perception. If something comes into my field of view, then there's a sense in which I know it. But I don't know it intimately. I don't know it personally. I don't know it through experience. Gnosis has to do with a deeper, deeper and more active knowledge. It implies an active relation between the one who knows and the person or thing that is known. And so this is a deep and intimate knowledge. In the first century uh, and in the New Testament describing the first century, this word is sometimes used to describe miraculous knowledge. You can look at a few passages to uh, show us that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 8, Paul says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, and to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. He implies miraculous knowledge there. Remember that Jesus said the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, would come and would guide them into all truth. The first century apostles and those upon whom they laid hands could have been guided miraculously into knowledge. And we recognize that in chapter 13 and verse 8, Paul says, Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now that doesn't mean like what happens to us where we forget where we put our keys or as we get older our knowledge, our, our memory begins to fade. It's talking about miraculous knowledge one day passing away when the miraculous gifts would pass away as well. And so there was miraculous knowledge, but for us, it doesn't work that way. Today what we're talking about is knowledge gained the good old-fashioned way by study. You see, you can't learn by osmosis. I remember as a child in a, in a classroom somewhere along the line was this poster. And this is a poster of Garfield, obviously. And Garfield, the heading of this poster is Learning by Osmosis. Osmosis is the process by which, in close contact, one thing is transferred to another. And so here's what Garfield's done. He's strapped books to himself, hoping that he will soak in the knowledge. I've had students who fell asleep on top of their textbooks, as if somehow their head's proximity to the textbook would allow the knowledge to seep in. But it doesn't work that way. But you know, there are many of us who have Bibles on our shelves at home. We have Bibles on our car. We have Bible in our car. We have Bible apps on our phones. But you think about it. If you looked at the app usage of, on your phone, those of you who frequently use smartphones, what percentage does your Bible app take up in the usage of what you do with your phones? So, so often we have our Bibles in close proximity. 
but we're not really using them, not always, not all of us, to increase in knowledge. And so what we're going to talk about this morning is knowledge. And we're going to talk about how it is an ingredient that we need in our lives, but we need to understand it in order to truly use it. Number one, let's start with maybe the most obvi obvious. Knowledge is a necessary ingredient. We cannot be pleasing to God if we do not know His will. It's impossible. We can't please God if we don't know what He expects. Hosea lays it out very plainly in Hosea 4 and verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge of God leads to destruction. And he goes on to say, because thou hast rejected knowledge. Notice their active part in not knowing. It wasn't something that passively happened to them. They actively rejected knowledge. And because of that, God said He would reject them. And they should be no priest to Him, seeing they had forgotten the law of thy God. He would also forget them. You see, when we don't know what we ought to know, when we don't know God's expectations for us, we place ourselves in a very dangerous position spiritually. A lack of knowledge is dangerous and it's necessary to know because the result is destruction if we don't know. God expects us to know His will. I want you to consider just how much pain has been taken by God providentially to bring us this word that we have before us. People have died to preserve, to translate, to... Uh, disseminate this message to the world. People have, have died preaching this message and living this message over thousands of years. Individuals have devoted themselves and God through His providence has ensured that we have a reliable record of what He expects of us. And therefore, we have no excuse not to know it. And not knowing it results in destruction. But number two, it's necessary despite the resistance that is so often given by other people. You see, there are lots of people in the world who are ready to either block our knowledge or give us things that are not right. Uh, you, you can go anywhere you like and you can find people who will teach just about whatever you want to hear. I remember uh, talking with, with someone one time and, and she was struggling with a very grievous sin in her life. And we sat down and this, this lady had grown up in the church and she knew what she was doing was wrong. And I sat down with her and we went through and as kindly as I could, I pointed out to her where the Bible said that this thing that she was doing was wrong. And you know what she said to me? I can go down the street and they will tell me that it's okay. I can find a place who will tell me that what I'm doing is not wrong. Even though the Bible clearly says it's wrong, even though she knows it's wrong, there is resistance to true knowledge in the world. And if you don't want to know, there are ample ways and ample resources for us not to know. Jesus condemned the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders of His day, because, and I, I think it's interesting how he describes it. He said, you have taken away the key of knowledge. You see, we often need someone to teach us. The Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot in Acts chapter 8 was reading Isaiah 53. And Philip came up and said, do you understand what you read? And what did he say? How can I except some man guide me? You see, and these individuals were supposed to be guides and instead they had taken away the key of knowledge. The, the picture there is, is really interesting. It's as if they shut the door on knowledge, locked the door with the key, and then threw away the key. And said, you can't get in there. When their whole purpose was to provide knowledge. But notice what else they did. Not only did they take away the key of knowledge, they didn't even use it themselves. How many people who are in positions to teach others don't even know what they need to know in order to do it? Now I'll readily admit that I don't know everything. I don't know everything. And there are times when, when, when my knowledge will be limited. There are times when I will misspeak. 
and say things that I shouldn't, but my number one objective, my number one responsibility as a teacher, and James says this in James chapter 3 and verse 1, or uh, Paul mentions this when talking about stewards. Moreover, is required in stewards what? That a man be found faithful. I have to be faithful to that which is entrusted to me, God's Word, as a teacher. And James said, Let not many be masters or teachers, knowing that they shall receive the greater condemnation. If I'm going to stand up and, and take a role of teaching, I better be sure that I know what I'm supposed to be teaching and that I can guide others into it as well. We recognize that there's so many situations, so many places we can go to find things that are not right. In Matthew 15 and verse 14, Jesus says concerning those Jewish leaders, they are blind leaders of the blind. And we know what happens when a blind person leads another blind person. Jesus says both will fall in the ditch. You see, you look at the religious world and the blind lead the blind. It seems like all the time. We need to recognize the resistance that the world gives to knowledge and we need to understand just how necessary true knowledge actually is. Number three, knowledge is necessary despite sometimes our own refusal to accept it. Have there been times in your life where you have known what was right but refused to acknowledge it? I've scratched my head at this passage in 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter condemns those who have denied in their lifestyles that Jesus will return and that judgment will come. And here's what Peter says. This they are willingly ignorant of. And he goes on to describe the flood as an example of God's judgment. If God will judge the world through a flood... He has promised in a similar fashion that He will judge the entire world once and for all. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat, He goes on to say in 2 Peter chapter 3. But notice He said that these people were willingly ignorant. They chose not to know. Does the ostrich really bury its head in the sand when it's confronted? I don't know if that's just a wives' tale or if that's really what they do. Do they really do that? My, son, my, my, my children usually know everything there is to know about interesting facts about animals. They've let me down today. But the, the adage is that the ostrich buries its head in the sand as if to say, if I don't know it, it doesn't exist. You know why babies can do, you can do peekaboo with babies? Because the baby has not yet learned the idea of object permanence. Somebody just texted me something. I guarantee you it has something to do with... No, they do not stick their head in the sand. I'm told from above. I do know this about babies. Babies have to learn object permanence. What that means is, if I can't see it, it still exists. So when you play, think about how horrible this is the next time you play peekaboo with a child. What you're doing is convincing that child that you've disappeared, that you no longer exist. That's why they go, oh, when you come back. Because they assume when they can't see you anymore that you actually do not exist. Now, what does that mean? What, what are we trying to say? There are times in our lives when we are just willfully ignorant of God's will. We know what we're supposed to do and we choose to pretend it doesn't exist. And I can't think of anything that is more frustrating than to see people who know what God's will is and yet who choose not to do it. Knowledge is necessary even if we refuse to follow it. So knowledge is necessary, number one, because of the result. If we don't know, we're on the path to destruction. Number two, knowledge is necessary despite the resistance from the world to true knowledge. And number three, knowledge is necessary despite sometimes our own refusal to believe and acknowledge that, that thing which is true. So knowledge, number one, then, is a necessary ingredient. Number two, knowledge is an active ingredient. What does that mean? Well, if you've got knowledge, you need to use it. Use it or lose it is an adage related to our, our physical abilities and, and even our mental capacities. And the tr same is true with knowledge. Go to Romans chapter 2, please. And let's look and see what Paul says to these Jews who for their entire existence were given the law of God. 
He would say in Romans chapter 3 and verse 1, what advantage has the Jew? And he says in verse 2, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. You see, the Jews had God's word. They had that advantage over the Gentiles. But notice in verse 17 of chapter 2. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. And look at verse 18. And knowest His will. See, that's a word akin to our word gnosis that we're studying this morning. And knowest His will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. So you know what you're supposed to do, Jew. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. He says, you Jews, you know what God expects out of you. You knew the Messiah was coming. You know if you really look at it that this is true, that Jesus is the Christ and that He expects you to be faithful to the new covenant. But then look at verse 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? And that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? As a grammar teacher, I've learned that my children, my students, take no greater pleasure in anything in the world than in catching me in a grammar mistake. Because I'm a grammar teacher. So I don't need to make a grammar mistake. Do I sometimes say ain't? I do. And the, one of the first things I teach those students in, uh, in grammar class is there's a difference between formal and informal speech. And so that gives me room to kind of, you know, use language, uh, use grammar in a way that maybe is not formal. But you see, making a mistake in something about which you ought to be an expert that is an example of hypocrisy. You see, in these Jews, these Jewish Christians in particular, they should have known. They had every tool at their advantage, and yet they didn't use their knowledge. If we know but don't use it, does it really do us any good? Well, absolutely not. Knowledge must be an active ingredient. What is wisdom? Wisdom is defined, uh, among other ways, in this way. The soundness of an action or decision with regard to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. You can have experience and not be wise. You can have knowledge and not be wise. You can have, you can possess the means to have good judgment and still not be wise because it's about the application of those things. How do you use what you're given? How do you use the knowledge that you gain? We only need to look to the great, the most, the wisest man ever to live, save Jesus Christ Himself. And if we look at Solomon, it's so interesting. In 1 Kings chapter 10, it is said of Solomon that he exceeded all of the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. That's chapter 10. Chapter 11 contains that three-letter word, but. But Solomon loved many strange women. And it goes on to say that those women took his heart away from God and he began to serve idols. And he began to do all of the things that the heathen world around him did even though he possessed wisdom greater than anybody else then living. You see, he didn't use that wisdom. He had knowledge, but he didn't apply it. And knowing and not doing is really not knowing at all. And that was the case with Solomon. And sadly, we see it in the lives of people that we know and love far too often. So knowledge, number one, is a necessary ingredient. Number two, it has to be an active ingredient. Number three a complementary ingredient. We dealt with this this morning in Bible class, compliment versus compliment. We won't go over that again. This is the right spelling of the word. Just uh, take my word for it. I want you to look at our text in 2 Peter chapter 1, from which we've gotten these Christian graces these last two months. And I want you to 
refresh in your mind the way that this passage is constructed and the point that Peter is trying to make overall. Pick up in verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things, verse 8, be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot have one of those graces and not the other. You can't work on those graces in a vacuum. The point that Peter is making is that these graces, that these uh, characteristics, that these values in our lives must work in concert with one another. You cannot just have knowledge. Do you know experts in the Bible who don't live as God directs? Do you know individuals who know God's Word but mistreat others? Do you know people who know God's Word and claim to live it, but who allowed that knowledge to make them arrogant and haughty? Knowledge must be a complementary ingredient. It must work with others. And the Bible specifically mentions at least two ingredients that our knowledge must be mixed with. Number one. Knowledge must be mixed with charity. Turn to 1 Corinthians 8 if you don't mind this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And what you'll notice is a discussion of scruples, matters of opinion. And I want you to look at verse 1 in which Paul says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. And what does he mean by that? What he means is, the, the child of God who is fully informed understands, and he's going to argue this later on, that meat offered to idols is just meat. We have that knowledge. Most informed, mature Christians have that knowledge. But I want you to notice what he says as you continue in verse 1. We know that we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. And if any man think that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Here's the point that Paul is making. If you have knowledge but you don't have love, then you really don't know anything yet. If you have all of these facts and if you have all of these ideas in your mind, but you don't know how to properly mix them with charity, with godly agape love, then it's really not knowledge. Knowledge in a vacuum doesn't help. Have you ever memorized a scripture and still not known what it says? Look, I might be able to spit out to you a formula that I, that I memorized in high school, some sort of algebraic formula or something, but do I have any clue what that means? Probably not. Probably not. You ever had computer trouble and you call someone and they say, okay, here's what you need to do on your computer. And they walk you through step by step. And you do everything that they say and your computer is fixed. And you didn't have a clue what you just did, but whatever it was, it worked. You have knowledge, but not real understanding. Not, no, you couldn't replicate that. You couldn't use it in its proper context. You see, knowledge without charity is absolutely useless. And Paul said, even though I know that an idol is nothing, and even though I know that meat offered to idols is still just meat, if I don't mix that knowledge with love for my weaker brother, then it's really not knowledge at all. Dear friends, let's be careful that the knowledge that we have is mixed with love and care for those around us. And that ties into the next point. Knowledge must be mixed with humility. In James chapter 3 and verse 13, James says, Who is a wise man? And endued with, here's our word, knowledge among you. Here's what he needs to do. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. If you have knowledge, here's what you need to do. Demonstrate it in your life and be humble. Do you know somebody who knows everything and wants everybody else to know that they know everything? I bought my wife a wonderful coffee mug. 
and the coffee mug says, I don't need Google. My husband already knows everything. I, I, didn't, I didn't see it. I thought it was a great mug. You know, it's a truthful. I gave it to her for Christmas. I use it more than she uses it. I don't know what that says about me. But there is sometimes a situation where knowledge breeds arrogance. And sometimes, if we're not careful, when we enter into religious discussions about God's Word, in which we know what the Bible says, if we're not careful, if we don't mix it with love, then what we communicate is arrogance and haughtiness and the idea that I, because I know, am better than you because you don't know. If you're not mechanically inclined and you take your car to a mechanic and that mechanic treats you like you're an idiot because you don't know what you need to do with your car, you probably won't go back to that mechanic, will you? I want a mechanic who will tell me, hey, here's the trouble. Let me explain to you what's going on. Same is true with physicians, right? In a few weeks, I've got my yearly checkup to my doctor. And one of the reasons we like this doctor is because he will sit down with you and he'll talk to you about what the problem is or what he sees and why he sees it. He doesn't talk to me like I'm not intelligent. He has knowledge. But it's tempered with humility. And it's tempered with charity. And we need to have that in our lives if we're to truly have the knowledge that we need. And then finally this morning... Well, one more passage to add to that. I found this quote as I was studying on knowledge. And one, I think it's a Greek philosopher maybe who said this, Knowledge is proud that she has learned so much. Wisdom is humble that she knows no more. Wisdom says there's a lot that I don't know and it makes me humble. Knowledge says look what I know. And it makes me proud. And there's a great difference between those two things, which leads us to our last point this morning. Knowledge is a limited ingredient. No matter how hard you try, you can't know everything. You can't. And therefore, there's no use for arrogance or haughtiness or this belief that you're better than someone else because all of our knowledge ultimately is limited. God said as much in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But notice this, but the things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. You see, in reality, what we know doesn't come from us. And so there's no reason for us to be haughty and arrogant because it's not our knowledge. We only know what God tells us. We only know what He's revealed. And every time we open up God's Word and every time we look at creation, we ought to be reminded how much we don't know. How much we don't understand. If you would ask me, what is the fundamental problem with science today? That's it. They've become convinced that they know everything. And that there are no questions to be answered fundamentally. They've got it all figured out. And they don't need God to help them. Well, you see, we need to understand that knowledge is a limited ingredient because there are so many things that we will never know on this side of eternity. In fact, only that which is revealed do we truly know when it comes to our spiritual lives and our relationship to God. But it's limited also by something else. It's limited by what is understood. Two passages that come to mind when we think about this, the limit of our knowledge. Ephesians 3 and verse 19 encourages us to know the love of Christ. Now, now I want you to understand the irony of this. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. How can you know something that is beyond knowledge? Well, I think here's what Paul's saying. You can't truly understand the love of Christ merely by gathering facts. Merely by memorizing information. You can know everything about Jesus' life. You can memorize every passage in the Bible. And all of those things are necessary and good to do in our lives. I'm not saying that. 
But until we truly understand in our lives the love of Christ, then we're never really going to know it. The love of Christ isn't something that we just learn in a book. It's something that we experience as we follow God. You don't really know the love that parents have for children. Not really. Until you become a parent. And so the love of parents to their children is a love that passes knowledge. You can't read... You expecting mothers who have never had children before, you don't really learn how to be a mother by what to expect when you're expected. Have you figured that out? You know, you can't... Danielle bought lots of books with the first child. We didn't use them very much with the second because you realize you, you can really only learn some things by experiencing it. Same is true with peace. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The only way to truly know peace is to follow God and experience it. I can't explain it to you. I can't draw you a diagram. I can't give you a map. If you don't know the peace of God, the only way to know it is in obedience to God. And as you live a life directed by God, you find peace and you know peace. But you can't learn it in a book. I can't explain it to you. I know it. But the only way for you to know it is the same way that I discovered it. You see, there's a limit to knowledge. And as we think about those things this morning, as we think about knowledge, may we understand this morning that it's a necessary ingredient. May we understand that it must be an active ingredient ingredient. We must use it in our lives. It must be a complementary ingredient combined with charity and humility because at the end of the day it is a limited ingredient. We only know what's revealed for us. But I don't want you to misunderstand me. We know enough. There are many people who approach religion they say, ah, well, you know, you can't really know anyway. So just do the best you can. The God that I read about in the Bible isn't a God who says, hey, go do the best you can. Hope it all works out. Instead, our God is a God who has taken great pains to inspire for us and to preserve for us the road map to heaven. And He's not left it to our guesses and to our trial and error. God has said... I have given you the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And He defines truth. And He shows us the way. And He provides for us the life. It's not guesswork. The things which are revealed unto us belong unto us and to our children forever. God has given them to us. And so this morning, the question for you is, number one, do you know? Do you know? What God expects out of you. Where do you find that? You find that in His Word. And as you thumb through the pages of the New Testament, you will find that Jesus expects faith. Without it, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews eleven six. He expects repentance. He expects a change of your life fundamentally in the way that you live and the things that you do. He expects confession with the mouth. He expects you to be willing to publicly acknowledge your faith as Peter did in Matthew chapter 16. He expects you to be baptized. Why? Because He commanded it. Because it places us in Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Because it washes away our sins, Acts 22, 16. You see, Jesus has made it clear. The New Testament has made it clear. And He expects you, Christian, to live faithfully. And He's outlined what that means. It's not a matter of guesswork. This morning, will you take the knowledge of God and will you apply it to your life? Will you make it an active ingredient in your life? Dear Christian, what about you? Are you willfully ignorant? Do you know, but maybe you don't do? Maybe you failed to do the things you know you should. You've, you've not done those things which you know you ought to do. Maybe this morning you need to change. 
and you need to make knowledge active in your life. I hope that if you're here this morning or if you're within the sound of my voice, that you will act upon the knowledge of God. Obey the gospel and be restored as together we stand and sing. <laughs>